It's that time again. It's Wednesday, 7.30 on the button tonight. Um, just got off a Dr. Bob call. And um, it's been a busy week. I've got a band coming in, rock band coming in from New York to record Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Uh, finished a country song today. Uh, what else have I done? Um, Compton tuned some vocals. Been a busy week. Uh, and then I've got a guitar session on, um, I'm not playing. Um, got a guitar session Friday morning on another country artist. So busy week, busy year so far, which I'm thankful for. I'm thankful to be working with these great artists and um, writing some cool songs and um, producing some cool songs. Um, this week, um, hey, Robert, I was just talking to Robert uh, earlier. Um, this week, uh, I've got some notes here, so pardon me for looking down at them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about meatloaf. Um, who sadly passed away this week, um, just really hit me hard. Um, I'm going to talk about Meatloaf, share some things. I spent some cool time with him. I wouldn't say that we were friends, but I probably spent seven to ten days with him, writing um, songs for him several different times, and he was nothing but awesome, full of energy, hilarious, would walk around the room flailing his arms, telling stories, bigger than life. He was the kind of guy that when he was in the room, everyone knew it, and um, he just he demanded all the attention and the energy in a beautiful, loving way, and um, was just fabulous. Great guy, hilarious, larger than life. Um, fantastic guy. So... I want to share um, some facts, some stories, meatloaf stories, and then um, I'll just open it up to um, any kind of questions you have about meatloaf or producing or writing or plugins or anything that um, anything you want. So, um, for those of you who know and don't know, um, meatloaf. Um, Hit the world with Bad Out of Hell, which I think close to today um, has sold 40 million albums. Um, he had a, such a unique style. Um, he and his writing partner, Jim Steinman, they wrote rock songs, but almost in a Broadway kind of storytelling, larger than life way. And Jim wrote all the songs and Meatloaf uh, sang them all and I'm sure was involved in the uh, the vocal production and the and in singing the parts and coming up with the parts but it was a really unique bond as um, I'm sure that uh, meatloaf was Jim Steinman's muse I mean he knew exactly how to write for meatloaf because he knew this huge big giant voice would be singing these voice, would be singing these songs, acting out these songs, would nail it live, and could act out the role of Meatloaf. Um, which, you know, this kind of situation is the same in lots of bands. I mean, I'm sure Eddie Van Halen, by the way, happy birthday to our beloved Eddie Van Halen in heaven today. We all, um, sorry about that. We all love you, Eddie, and... Um, miss you, and um, gosh, what a legend. But I'm sure Eddie would, his muse would be the way that David Lee Roth could perform and um, sing songs. He would write for his range. He would write for his personality or Sammy's or the way that the uh, Aerosmith guys and other writers write for Steven Tyler. I mean, you, you, you know... As a writer, you know what you're aiming for. 
you know the voice, you know the character that these singers play. And it's an important lesson for all of us as we write, to write for the singer that we know that we're writing the songs for. Um, when you have a clear view of how to write, how these singers pull things off, and Jim Steinman and Meatloaf um, were as good at that as anyone that's ever written songs. Um, such a unique style. And it's funny because when the Spat Out of Hell record came out, Rolling Stone panned it. Um, Howard, St Howard Stern says that they gave it zero out of five stars. Now, I've not been able to find that information, but I have been able to see the uh, reviews, the genius Rolling Stone reviews of the record, and they basically panned it. Um, of course, Years later, as it sold 40 uh, million records, it's on the time, top 500 Rolling Stone uh, important uh, albums of all time. So um, shows you how important critics are. Um, but let me run down a few, um, uh, and pardon me while I read this, because it's some good stuff, and then I want to tell you some stories. But um, let me um, read you a few things about Meatloaf's... Um, um, Bad Out of Hell album, uh, one of the biggest uh, selling albums in history, over 43 million copies. Um, it's only beaten in rankings by Michael Jackson's Thriller, ACDC Back in Black, and Whitney Houston's The Bodyguard. Um, excellent company there. Um, it continues to sell 200,000 copies a year. I mean, if someone comes out now and sells 200,000 copies, that's a hit. So it continues to do that. Um, he was turned down for years. Um, Clive Davis, one of the biggest uh, music executives in the in that's ever been in the music industry, said um, he turned it down. Um, he disparaged Steinman songs and acknowledged that he had misjudged the singer. How about that? The songs were coming over as very theatrical and meatloaf despite a powerful voice, just didn't look like a star. He looked like the role, though, didn't he? Um, uh, to Clive's credit, he did write that about himself in, um, in his memoir, The Soundtrack of My Life. So I'll give him credit for missing the boat on that one. Um, Bad Out of Hell producer, Tom Todd Rundgren, a famous artist, producer, plays about every instrument, um, uh, has produced The Tubes, uh, Meatloaf, other artists, and um, as even a couple years or more in Ringo's touring all-star band. Um, was the producer. He initially brought the album as, uh, thought the album as a parody of Bruce, Spring Bruce Springsteen's grandiose style. Um, and um, also, uh, Bruce Springsteen's keyboard piano player, Roy Bitten, played on Bad Out of Hell, and later on, I think it was Bad Out of Hell 2, with the um, the big hit, um, I could do any, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. He played on that, as well as, um, I think my um, friend Tim Pierce played guitar, and Max Weinberg also played on Bad Out of Hell. I think... I can I would do anything for love, but I can't, won't do that. Was written. Uh, I think Kenny Ar Aronoff uh, played drums on that. Um, what else do we have here? Um, um, with the help of another Springsteen sideman, Stevie Van Zant, "Bad Out of Hell" was acquired by Cleveland International, a subsidiary, a subsidiary of Epic Records. So they probably went through uh, every. Big label there was, got turned down on this little subsidiary, um, lapped it up, and the rest is history. Um, is there anything else here? Um, anyway, some interesting facts about a 40 million selling album that no one wanted and um, didn't get the songs, didn't get the singer, didn't get the look of the singer, and here we are. Um, all these years later, mourning one of the greatest ever. Um, I had the privilege of being called out to Los Angeles about, I don't know, 12 years ago to write for 
a um, meatloaf album that producer Rob Cavallo uh, was producing. Uh, I went out, another great writer, um, Dave Bassett was there as well, that's written a lot of stuff for Shinedown, and then another great writer uh, from um, Nashville, Zach Malloy, was there writing as well. And then, for the life of me, I can't remember who the fourth writer was, but um, we all set up um, at Rob Cavallo's house and in decided instead of pairing off to you two write and you two write, um, um, we all decided to write the songs together. Mm -hmm. So we wrote for three or four days uh, at Rob Cavallo's house, which was amazing. At the same time, Rob um, was at his house. He's converted his two car or three car garage or four car garage into a studio and they were recording an album in there. I think it might have been David Cook's album um, from um, American Idol. And uh, my friend Tim Pierce was also playing there at the same time. And um, um, I think that's the record that they were recording in the studio while we were in Rob's incredible house set up in his living room and he said, ah, you guys just going right. And here's my cigars and wine and you guys do your thing. It was this amazing home in Hidden Hills, which um, was where um, my favorite drummer, Jeff Beccaro, had lived. He had, he had passed on at that point, but great, incredible neighborhood in the valley. Um, and uh, we shacked up there for three or four or five days and wrote. And at Rob's request, he said, I don't want you guys to go off and do demos. At the end of the day, I want you to play us the song that you wrote. So he had guitars and keyboards and bass, and he had um, an electronic drum kit coming through an amp. So I played drums. The other guys played guitar and bass and keyboards. And at the end of the day, Rob Cavallo and Meatloaf would come in and we would perform the song that we had just written. So we had all memorized or charted out the song, and I can still remember Rob Cavallo and Meatloaf jamming to our song, and yeah, that's great, and it was an amazing experience, amazing experience. And um, unfortunately, I didn't get any songs on the record. Um, our little group that had written, none of the songs made it, um, which is how the music business works most of the time, but it was an awesome time and um, not getting a song on the album doesn't diminish my loving memories of that week and to the other for the other writers and for Meatloaf and Rob Cavallo and the experience. Unbelievable experience. I remember um, John Mayer lived across the street and it was the time at the time that Jennifer Aniston, sorry, my phone keeps going off where my notes are. Sorry about that. Uh, he was dating Jennifer Aniston at the time, and we would see them pull into the driveway across the street. So we we all felt like we were uh, big Hollywood dudes writing the Meatloaf record with John Mayer and Aunt Jennifer Aniston across the street. But um, in the um, in the middle of writing songs, Meatloaf would tell these unbelievable stories. Like I said, flailing and pacing and you know like he was on stage and we were just all captivated and one story he told was his buddies bet him a case of beer that he wouldn't go out for the track team so he took the bet went out for the track team and while he was practicing um out um on the field got hammered with a shot put in his head Somebody had thrown this long shot put, and I don't know if he wasn't watching or they wouldn't they weren't watching where they were throwing it, but it hammered him in the head and knocked him down. And he swears that that's the day that changed his life because he couldn't sing a note, never tried to sing anything because his voice was so terrible. He couldn't hear pitch, nothing. But after he got hit in the head by a shot put, he could sing like that the rest of his life. Um, couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe the story. We were cracking up and he was cracking up and sweating, telling us the story. And I was on the track and I got hit in the head and knocked down and all the coaches came around and I was on the ground bleeding and it was awful. And somehow he figured 
at that point in his life, he could hear pitch and sing and sing along with the radio. <laughs> the rest is history. Um, the other interesting story um, he told is he was so approachable and cool. I went up to him and I said, man, he, he told us to call him Meat. So I called him Meat. I said, man, Meat, I've been dying to ask you this question. And I could do anything for love, but I won't do that. What is that? I said, I, I've never been able to figure that out. And I'm going to, I've got some notes here um, to um, remind me of what that means, because it means different things. He said, it's easy, Bobby. It's easy. It's the last word in every pre-chorus before the chorus starts. That's what I won't do. And I was like, wow, what? So the last line of each pre-chorus is, but I'll never forget the way you feel right now. But I'll never forgive myself if we don't go all the way tonight. But I'll never do it better than I do it with you. And, but I'll never stop, but I'll never stop dreaming of you every night of my life. Those are the lines that he means I won't do that in the chorus. And it's, it's interesting because those lines are so far away from I won't do that, it may be a little confusing. And I found this quote, he didn't tell me this part, but I found this um, quote online. Um, Meatloaf says, when we were recording it, Jim brings up the thing. He says, people aren't going to know what that is. Meatloaf said, of course they are. And how can they not know? He goes, they're not going to know. So Jim Steinman felt a little bit funny that those lines were so separated from I won't do that, that he was worried that people wouldn't know what that is. Um, and many, probably many people don't. Um, I certainly didn't. And I'd heard that song for years and years and years on the radio and um, loved it. You know, such a dramatic song, arrangement, playing, all the above. Great mix um, that um, it didn't seem to matter. I mean, the, sh the song was huge, went number one, and um, it was just so captivating and so dramatic in his voice that it didn't seem to matter. But if you look at the lyrics like he explained them, it does make sense. Those are the things that he wouldn't do. So... Another interesting story, and he was so cool to share that, and just an awesome guy. Later on, I was writing with a couple other writers, Greg Becker and Blue, oh man, what's his last name? I'll think of it. We got a cut on a later, Chris, um, a later Meatloaf record called Fall From Grace, and um that was a total thrill, a total surprise, because we weren't even writing that song for Meatloaf. I can't remember who we were writing it for, but I was out in L.A. again, and I think it was like a song camp where they get all these writers in to write different songs for a certain record. And somehow Meatloaf or his people heard that song, and um, Blue Macaulay, that's who it is. And we got that song on a Meatloaf record, and it was thrilling. Um it was um, fantastic. I mean, it was uh, Chris Lord Algae mixed it. I think Chris Lord Algae mixed a lot of Meatloaf's later stuff, which totally makes sense because Chris knows how to make those huge records. And um, But it was a thrill to finally get a Meatloaf cut and hear his, um, hear his voice singing our melodies and our lyrics. And... Um, they're just all incredibly warm uh, memories of him, his personality, his career, his movie career. He was in Fight Club. He was in uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, other other movies and bit parts on TV. And um, man, was just a pro in everything he did. He was awesome at everything he did. So it's super sad to see people like that go because... There'll never be another Meatloaf, like there'll never be another Eddie Van Halen. These people find a way to do something that's different than anyone else. 
which is a, a great lasting lesson uh, for me and for anyone that, you know, should be find a way that resonates with people, but tweak it differently than other things you've heard. Take all these influences, but try to make it your own thing, um, which is very hard to do. But um, doing it that way, find when you're looking at Spotify and the radio and you see all, hear all this music out there, be influenced by it, but look at what's not there and find a way to do something that's not there. Of course, make it accessible. Of course, make it something that you think people are going to respond to and make it true to your heart and true to your artistry. But, you know, doing, doing a, a great song that sounds like a smash that kind of sounds like Billie Eilish, that a singer kind of does that thing, man, it's already been done. And so many, so many people try to be copycats and I've tried to be a copycat. And so many labels try to find the next Billie Eilish or the next whoever's hot. And all you're going to be is second best to that. And I, I see so many artists now that are so young artists that are so captivated by their heroes that they want to sing like them or record songs like them or record songs from writers that wrote the songs that they're their heroes um, recorded and it's just it, it just is not going to end up like you think it's not you're never going to be them you're not supposed to be them think of all the eddie van halen clones out there guys that play faster guys guys that play cleaner guys that play like him and there's only one eddie van halen because Eddie did it differently. He loved Clapton and Hendrix and, and Alan Holdsworth and all that stuff. But Eddie did it differently. And as many of the clones, and as many of the clones that have had big careers, there's only one Eddie. Same with Meatloaf. All the great rock singers. I mean, Brad Dell, um, Steven Tyler. I mean, go down the list. Steve Perry, Lou Graham. All these guys did their own thing. And Meatloaf really did his own thing sang awesome and and um and just really did did it in a dr overly dramatic but super cool way and acted it out on stage in an awesome way so anyway um i wanted to get that um out i want to take a moment tonight to really um say that he was a wonderful guy and um, it just so happens it's Eddie Van Halen's birthday. So I want to do, um, you know, it's great to, it's, we, we, we look up to our heroes um, in a very special way because we spend so much time listening to them. We almost, um, I never, I never knew Eddie. I never got to meet Eddie, but I almost feel like I know him because of his music. So these are interesting losses. Um, it's kind of a weird place to compartmentalize these things, but um, it's sure nice to come on here and talk about them with you and um, answer any questions and um, have these moments. I did get some questions this week. Here I am again looking at my phone um, on uh, my website. I mean, my website, my, um, my email. And let me find them. Uh, where are they? Um, looking, looking. Uh, hang on. Should have prepared, right? Where did I put them? Um, Here's a few. Um, these came from Dr. Bob Music Surgery at gmail.com. Dr. Dr. Period Music Surgery at gmail.com. Um, 
One of them um, is what um, what drums are you using these days? Samples and triggers. Um, I use a lot of my own that I give away every month. Um, you can go to any one of my videos, and there are um, here we go. There are links in my videos in the description of my videos to um, the Doctor's Lounge. Uh, check that out. I give away samples every month and stems and one-on-one -on -one, uh, phone conversations about anything you want to ask, your mix, your uh, your song, your production, um, how to tackle certain things. And I also have a drum set and cymbals, Dr. Bob's Killer Kit and Dr. Bob's Sizzlin' Cymbals. There are videos of each of those. And in the description of those videos, you can link, uh, click on the description, pay what you want. And when you click on it, on pay what you want, wait 10 seconds and it will give you um, a link to download the samples. There will be additions to all of those um, in the Dr. Bob's Killer Kit and Symbols uh, just ahead. I'm going to keep putting stuff out for those. Thanks to everyone that's bought those and donated and thanks to everyone who um, is part of the doctor's lounge um i think i've been asked this question before but i'm going to answer it again what was it like working with hailstorm um the band hailstorm they're fantastic great musicians lizzie lzzy is the lead singer and probably the strongest rock female singer i've ever heard in my entire life um, could sing all day long, not lose her voice. Um, incredible pitch, incredible phrasing, incredible timing. Uh, the biggest problem was she'd sing the song 20 times. And as I would go through the takes, I, I'd have trouble comping which one I wanted because each one was so great. And she would do little inflections on different ones. And just fantastic. I mean, just absolutely fantastic. Sweet, a very sweet person. A uh, great singer, great in the studio, great live. So um, that's my hailstorm uh, time with them, which is fantastic. Uh, why do you use Cubase? I've answered it before, but happy to answer again. It's because that's what I started off with. Um, I love Cubase. I started on that. It's I, I love the navigation. It's easy to get around. The MIDI is fantastic. Um, the um, it sounds great, all the plugins, uh, the third party stuff works great, and it's just what I love. There are other great DAWs out there that are just as good. Find something that you love that you get around quickly and that feels comfortable to you, and you'll be just fine. Um, what is your favorite SSL style bus compressor? Um, my favorite at the moment is the Slate SSL style bus compressor. Um, I've used the Waves. I've used one called the Glue. Um, I've tried out the Townhouse bus compressor this week. Um, I AB'd that to the Slate, and it was really close. I'm going to try it again. It didn't work as well on the song that uh, I was working on. I think it might work better on a rock song. This was a real pop track with tons of background vocals, and it was a real slick-sounding track, and it was a little bit hairy for that but um it's a great compressor um i think it's by brainworks they've modeled the um uh, they've modeled the ssl bus compressor on the ssl at townhouse studios the legendary townhouse studios in england where i got a chance to work and um they had done some mods to that um ssl bus compressor and they've um uh, They've copied that. I uh, found out uh, about it on on one of these um, live streams. And great call, you guys. Um, let me see if I got a few more here. Do you ever use a mix template? Yes, I do. I have several different mix templates, which means I can open up a project, a Cubase project with no audio in it, but I've got a rough... Um, vocal chain, um, some rough drum chains, some mix bus stuff, uh, my master bus stuff. So 
every project, I don't have to bring in every one of these uh, plugins every single time. They're there and ready. Now, for depending on the song and the singer, the tempo and all that, all these things get tweaked, but I don't have to bring them into the project and, and you know, bring them into certain tracks. They're already there. So I would recommend that to anyone. I have different ones. I have rock ones. I have metal ones. I have country. I have country pop. I have EDM. I have um, straight up pop. So each one of these, I kind of have a good rough setting to get started on. So if you don't do mixed templates, check that out. Um, let me see. Sorry, my phone keeps turning off. Do you know Rick Beato? Yeah, I know Rick Beato. Rick got me started on YouTube. He's a great guy. He's a great YouTuber. He's a great uh, producer. He probably knows more about music than anybody I've ever met and more ab about uh, uh, soundtracks to Metallica to Theory to what bottom snare head Lars uses. So, um, and he's, he loves jazz. He's into jazz. I mean, just uh, go check out his channel if you already haven't. Obviously, um, just YouTube Rick Beato. He's a great guy. We talk all the time. We get together here in Nashville. And um, he's one of the best there ever was at YouTube. And check out his channel. Um, are you the same Bobby Huff that played drums for Black Hawk? Yes, that's me. Guilty as charged. I played... Um, on some Blackhawk records. I toured with them and ended up producing some stuff on their greatest hits. I love all those guys. We still keep in touch. It was a great experience. I've never done a major tour like, I had never done a major tour like that before. And I learned a ton about the road, about making records, um, how to be a side guy in a group, uh, how to travel. Um, it was, um, it was an experience I'll never forget. And, um, thankful for the rest of my life. Um, they're still kicking it, doing great. They had a lot of hits back in the day when we were with them, and it was quite a ride. Um, it was a great time. Um, I've kind of retired my my uh, my touring sticks and enjoy producing and writing and doing YouTube and all that now. And I'm also a professor. I'm teaching at a university here in Nashville once a week on Thursday nights. So that's something new. Never thought I'd be a professor, but um, it doesn't take up a whole lot of time. I've only done one class so far. I've got one tomorrow night, but that's also um, given me a lot of um, ideas for the channel. And it's awesome to keep spreading around what I know. Um, let me see if I have one more here. Um, were you in a band with Tim Pierce? Yes, I was in a band with Tim Pierce. When I lived in Los Angeles, we were in a band and the singer was a guy named Mark Spiro and the bass player was Randy Jackson from American Idol and Journey. And we recorded a bunch of stuff. We went in the studio with producer Keith Olsen. We were set to go in the studio at A&M to record our record, but um, some politics got involved the night before and we never made that record. But uh, another great experience. I learned a ton from those guys. Um, Mark Spiro was a big rock writer and I got to sit in the room and watch him write a lot of songs with uh, the Bad English guys, Hart, David Lee Roth, Steve Perry, and I got to be um, his drum programmer and I would uh, program drums and do some keyboard parts and watch him write and that was basically like me going to writing university to see how he approached rights how he approached every different artist and um, if you can get if you can talk somebody into um, being a fly on the wall in, in rights and in, in sessions and in anything like that you'll learn more by doing that and, and, and watching how things go down than you will anything else. I was also what they call a runner um, at A&M Studios um, when I first moved to Los Angeles before I had any gigs. A runner is basically like the lowest guy on the totem pole in a studio, below second engineers and all that. And I would wind cables. I would go get people sandwiches. I would 
get them coffee. I would answer the phone, but I got to be in rooms and watch records being made. Uh, Don Henley, um, uh, the, in the Innocents, U2, uh, Madonna, Toto, um, Bruce Springsteen, uh, and uh, Bad English. Um, just to watch these things go down um, and how these producers approach things and how these bands um, recorded in the studio. I mean, these are, again, it was producer university. Um, watching guys like Danny Korchmar produce uh, Henley's record and uh, guys like Ron Nevison and uh, Keith Olsen and um, who else? Jimmy Iovine and um, Bob Clear Mountain Mix, and the list goes on. a and was the mecca of the universe in the late 80s and 90s. And even though I was a teeny tiny, teeny tiny speck on that universe, I learned a ton from it. So anyway, let me now go back and see if there's any questions from the stream here. Sorry, I'm slow at this, guys, but I appreciate you all being here. Uh, let me see if there's anything on here. Hello from Chicago. Hey, L. Bailey. Love Chicago. I grew up in Indiana. Just um, a little ways from you. Um, fantastic city. Great food. Great culture. Did you ever hear Meatloaf play drums? No. Kevin, I did not hear him play drums. Didn't even know he did. Um, not surprising, but no, I never heard Meatloaf play drums. Um, Several East Street band played on Bad Out of Hell, if not mistaken. Yes, Robert Thompson. Yes, um, Roy Bitten and Max Weinberg played on Bad Out of Hell, um, and I didn't know that till today. Um, I know Roy Roy Bitten played on. I could do anything I love. Uh, I, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Years and years later, but I didn't know that he played on Bad Out of Hell. And yes. Aronoff played on most of Bad Out of Hell 2 and 3. Yes, Aronoff did play on that stuff. Great drummer. Um, fantastic drummer. Another Indiana guy. Um, I actually hired Kenny once when I was producing a band called Confederate Railroad to play on two songs. And he was fantastic. Cool guy. Played great. That lope that he has, that... I call it the John Mellencamp lope because it just feels like Midwest rock to me. And, and he's stayed around after and told great stories about being on the road and playing for Mellencamp and Seeger, and he was fantastic. Um, I don't like to play drums when I'm producing unless I'm playing, I'm the last guy on the song, and we track these songs, so that's why I didn't play on it. I can't be a drummer and play and focus on that and look at the big picture at the same time, so no better guy to hire than Kenny Aronoff. Scott G, I believe most of the musicians from Scott Rundgren's Utopia played on the album. Kasem Sultan of Utopia played bass on tour with Meatloaf for a while. Didn't know that. Thanks, Scott. Um, I am embarrassed to say I love Tom Rundgren's stuff. I love the way he writes and plays and stacks his um, vocal harmonies and his great sense of keyboard with great chord voicings, but I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know the guys in Utopia. Um, but thanks for that. Um, hello from Seattle. Love Seattle. I was just out in Portland. I love the Pacific Northwest. Um, been on, to Seattle several, several times on tour. Landed in the bay there um, on a seaplane. Uh, went to the first Starbucks ever. Uh, went to, gosh, Five Coins. 50 Coins. There's a great restaurant there. Can't remember the name. Something like Five Coins or something. Love Seattle. Um, can you do a breakdown video of anything for love like you did with Billy Jean and Blinding Lights? Um, great idea. Um, let me see if I have those tracks. Don't know if I do, but um, that would be a tough one. Um, lots of Lots of stuff going on there. The Rocker, Meets Vocal on Free For All album are awesome. Yes, Meets Vocal always. Now, I will say, later in years, by the time he recorded the song that I was co-wrote on, he didn't 
have the same voice that he did on Bad Out of Hell and Bad Out of Hell 2. Uh, he was much older. He had a different voice with as much character and as much vibe. He didn't quite have the range and the power, but man, that's that's just how it rock and roll. I mean, you get older. I mean, you look at guys like Paul Stanley and um, Steve Perry and um, Bon Jovi. I mean, guys that sang high for all, not high, but sang high and register all those years. I mean, it, it, as 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 they get to be older men, it's just hard to sing like you did in your late 20s and 30s. Um, but Steve Perry still sings great. Um, Meatloaf still sang great. It was different, but it worked. And it was awesome that he found a different way to do it um, as he aged. Um, have you ever used Pro Tools or Logic? I've recorded um, with other people's a million uh, other people a million times in Pro Tools section, sessions or Logic uh, Pro. Um, yeah, they're both fantastic. Um, tons, especially Pro Tools. Pro Tools is everywhere, and a lot of Logic, a lot of Logic in um, Europe and um, London. So yes, um, I, but I've never been the hands-on guy, the navigator. Um, but been in millions of sessions that those DAWs are part of, and they're both fantastic. Um, can you get Randy Jackson to sand sign my samurai sword? Sure, I'll get right on that. That's funny, Robert. Uh, Tony Morgan, off topic from a music experience perspective, but is that a ductless AC unit on the wall behind you? If yes, are you able to use it? while mixing and recording. Is it quiet enough? Tony, great question. That's a, that's a great question. And yes, it is. It is a, it's by Mitsubishi and it's called Mr. Slim. And it is absolutely silent. It's fantastic. Um, it's great in the winter for warm, great in the color, uh, the summer for cold. And yes, Look for Mr. Slim stuff by Mitsubishi. They are not cheap, um, but they're great. They come with a remote. There's all kinds of different um, settings, and I would highly, highly recommend it. Great question. Um, Aaron Young, thank you for doing YouTube. Aaron, thank you for watching. Uh, thanks to everyone who watches and comments and is part of the, uh, the channel and part of these streams. I love it all. Um, it's a, still a fairly new thing in my life, and it, I, I'm having a blast doing it. Uh, do we have any more? Um, the Rocker. Hey, man, enjoy the channel from South Bend, Indiana. Hey, South Bend, I grew up in Alexandria, Indiana, a tiny little town close to Muncie and Anderson. And um, I love Indiana, and we still go there on holidays and stuff. And... Um, it was a super Midwestern upbringing, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I met I met my wife there. Um, same question. Have you ever used Pro Tools or Logic? No, I've been on a million sessions with them, but I have not um, navigated on them. I don't know how to do that. Um, never felt the need to learn. If I was an independent mixer and engineer, I would absolutely 100% use Pro Tools. Now, I am an independent mixer, but guys bounce their files to zero, and I mix on Cubase and send them back to them, and then I print stems on Cubase um, because it's all WAV files, or um, so everything's interchangeable. But um, I'm going to wrap it up. I got stuff I need to do tonight, and um, it's a pleasure to be on here. New video coming out tomorrow, as always on Thursdays. I love doing these on Wednesday nights. Uh, hit me with an email on uh, Dr. Bob Music Surgery at gmail.com. Dr. Period Music Surgery at gmail.com. Check out my store where there's cheap and free stuff and the Doctor's Lounge. There's links to those in all the descriptions of my videos. And check out the Dr. Bob's Killer Kit and Dr. Bob's Sizzle and Symbols. Um, there's videos about those. 
where I show what's in these packs. And then there's links below in those videos. Um, and um, you pay what you want. So hit the link, pay what you want, then wait 10 seconds to get, uh, to get um, the download and hit the download and they're all yours. So that's it for this week. Um, thanks again. Stay warm. It's winter and it's cold in Nashville. The Titans lost. That sucked. But there's always next year. So anyway, take care of yourselves and each other. And I'll see you guys the next time the doctor's in. Take care. Bye.